Good morning. My name is Matthew Bellany. I am the executive editor of The Hollywood Reporter and Billboard magazines, both of which cover the entertainment and music industries um, from a business perspective, but from all perspectives now. And I wanted to start by just posing a hypothetical question. How much do you believe what you read online nowadays? Um, and more importantly, this is another question, do you ever find yourself clicking on something online and then when you're looking at it, whether it's a photo or a video or a story, thinking maybe you shouldn't be looking at this? I think that's something that we can all agree happens a lot more now than it used to happen. And you know, during my 10 years as an entertainment journalist, uh, I have been called many things by many people, a lot of them lawyers, um, <laughs> scumbag, tabloid, all sorts of things. And often these lawyers will threaten. They'll say, you know, we're going to sue you for what you've posted online, um, which I always find amusing somewhat because in my previous career, before I was a journalist, I was a lawyer. And I represented actors and directors and other talent in Hollywood, often against media companies that printed and published things that they didn't want. So I have somewhat of a unique perspective on this, coming from both sides of the equation. And the, the key issue is that we are in a media environment now, unlike there has ever been. Uh, there was a study this week that came out that said that Americans have less trust in the media than they've had in the, in the history of the country. I don't know how they went all the way back to the beginning, but uh, that's, that's a pretty daunting stat. Yet at the same time, people in this country are consuming more media than they ever have before. They're just consuming it in different ways. Everything from your Facebook feed, to your Twitter followers, to your Instagram followers, Snapchat videos, TV, print, everything under the sun is now media, and we're looking at it more than we ever have before. But what this proliferation of media has done is it's created a, um, a new paradigm and, and a lot of tensions that exist, both in the media world and the legal world and how they combine. Uh, so I wanted to talk a little bit about that today and use some current cases that are kind of at the forefront of this issue, in my opinion. Some of them, you, a couple you probably heard of, a couple you probably haven't. But um, the overriding thing here is that the media landscape we exist in now is completely unprecedented. Um, it's unlike anything we've ever seen. And I don't have to tell you that because some of you are probably looking at your Facebook feed right now. Uh, and if you're not, you're, you may be wondering what's going on in your Facebook feed, and you may be wondering whether someone has liked your Instagram photo, or whether you have caught up with something that Kim Kardashian may or may not have said on Snapchat. So uh, I want to talk, first of all, about a case that um, you probably have heard of. This is the Gawker versus, uh, sorry, Hulk Hogan versus Gawker case. Um, and it brings up a very important issue of invasion of privacy and what that means in the digital age. Because the laws that govern invasion of privacy and defamation and other things that are designed to protect the public from a very powerful media, in my opinion, don't really apply or need to be updated. They don't really reflect the media environment we live in. And, and we're going to go through these, and, and I'll show you some examples. For those that aren't familiar, um, the Gawker case was a, a, an invasion of privacy case. Uh, it's still going on. It's an invasion of privacy case and some other claims. But uh, it's based on the invasion of privacy law that says two things. Action can be taken if someone, quote, publicly reveals truthful information that is, one, not of a public concern, and which, two, a reasonable person would find offensive. That's an interesting question these days, when there is so much out there on the internet, and you know, this notion of what a reasonable person would find offensive, to me, is, is a bit antiquated, because everything is online. What is a reasonable person? But that's not the issue in this case. The issue is the newsworthiness of posting a two-minute clip of a sex tape 
that involved Hulk Hogan and a woman who was not his wife. I won't get into the details. Um, he was surreptitiously recorded. That video was leaked to Gawker, which if you're not familiar with Gawker, um, was a gossip news, kind of a salacious website, um, part of a media company called Gawker Media, which owned several different gossip sites and tech sites and other things. Um, and I remember when I saw this video posted, I happened to be in my office and I would frequently look at Gawker, and I clicked on it and I watched this video. And I remember thinking to myself, first, this is pretty gross. Uh, second, this isn't gonna be up for very long. This is gonna be taken down. And in most cases, that's what happens. Someone posts something online, lawyers get upset, send a letter, send a note, it comes down, maybe it pops up on five other sites, they try to go after it there. Eventually, if lawyers want something down, they can usually try to get, they can usually get it down. Um, but Gawker said no. Gawker is one of the, or was one of the few outlets willing to stand up for this First Amendment protection that they believe they had to publish this two-minute video, which they called newsworthy, and they said it was newsworthy because, among other things, Hulk Hogan is a person in the public eye. He's a famous wrestler, is a reality star. And he had talked extensively about his sex life in many media forums, including the Howard Stern Show and all sorts of other things, which, in Gawker's opinion, put this subject into the public eye. So is it newsworthy? I certainly clicked on it. I'm sure many people in the same situation in this room might have clicked on that. The traffic on that video was sky high for Gawker, they testified. But in a trial, in a Florida jury, that argument didn't fly. The jury awarded $140 million in damages to Hulk Hogan, $40 million more than even he asked for. And that, I think, right now, in this digital world, is where the line in the sand is. This is a pretty odious example. This is something that I think it's hard to argue that a private sex tape of someone who is marginally in the public eye um, is newsworthy. They made a valiant effort, and it's still on appeal, but I think that a lot of people find this offensive and were not happy, but understood when this verdict occurred. There's a side plot in the sense that, that the billionaire Peter Thiel was revealed as having funded the litigation on behalf of Hulk Hogan, which raises an entirely different set of issues that I think people might find equally troubling when billionaires start to secretly get involved in cases. Peter Thiel was upset over some previous coverage that Gawker had done. Um, but that's a separate issue. If you're, if you're into, uh, if, you, if you believe that Citizens United does not allow, uh, should not allow political contributions to fund speech, you also have to be against Peter Thiel secretly funding this if that's speech. But that's a whole separate issue. Um, the Gawker case, I think, is a, a good example of where that line in the sand is. But I want to draw your attention to another case um, that is getting less attention. It is a case involving ESPN and one of its reporters. Um, ESPN is being sued by the New York Giants defensive end, Jason Pierre-Paul, uh, who is a big football star, and he was in the hospital for a mysterious injury that, he, that occurred last July 4th. An ESPN reporter named Adam Schefter, who I wasn't familiar with until this case, but apparently he has four million Twitter followers, uh, he, tweeted, he tweeted a photo of a medical report that showed that this football player had had his finger amputated after an accident over July 4th weekend. That's big news in the NFL. Gambling lines, uh, fans, you know, weekend plans. Uh, the NFL is a gigantic business. That is news in the sports context. He's suing for invasion of privacy under the argument that you had no right to publish my private medical record. It's a very similar case to the Gawker case without the salacious element, um, although the photo of his hand is equally gross. Uh, but it's an interesting case to me because a judge was presented with this argument this summer and refused to throw out the case. And 
a lot of people thought that the judge would, thinking this is a matter of public concern, it's a matter of news in the sports world, but the case is being allowed to continue, and he's going to be allowed to make the same argument that Hulk Hogan made, that this is something that is private, and then in this digital world, you don't have the right to just tweet a photo of a medical record. That's a private thing, even though it may impact all these other businesses. Um, so I think that that, to me, is a less clear-cut case, and it really goes to this push-pull situation we're in with digital media. When anything can be posted online at any moment by any person, who gets to say who should post it online? And how do the laws governing invasion of privacy and other, and other areas of this, this uh, aspect of law get updated or evolve to encapsulate these kinds of interesting situations that were inconceivable when the First Amendment was enacted. Who would have known that it would be possible instantly to tweet a photo of a medical report and cause someone to potentially lose out on a million dollar contract and all the other consequences that came from that? Um, and the, the, I'd like to highlight a third case. This is involving a person you may know named Blake Shelton. Uh, Blake Shelton is a uh, music star, he's on The Voice. He is suing a magazine called In Touch Weekly for defamation. And I'll read you the, claim, the, the elements of a defamation claim. Uh, they're very simple. You have to make a false and defamatory statement. It has to be public. It has to, in a celebrity context, you have to show actual malice, meaning you have to have known it was false and gone, gone forward with the statement anyways. Um, that's a key difference for someone in the public eye. And in most cases, you have to show damages. And the damages element is what I want to talk about because I think the damages in today's modern digital media environment is a tougher call to make. If you look at the claim, the claim was essentially, you can see it right here, that Blake Shelton went to rehab. And Blake Shelton's friends had an intervention and decided that he needed to go to rehab for alcohol abuse. Um, he was not happy with that, obviously. Even though I'm not a fan of The Voice, I hear he talks about drinking a lot on The Voice, so maybe that was an impetus for this, I don't know. But what's interesting to me is that defamation law is premised on the fact that you need to stand up. You know, there needs to be a mechanism for individuals to stand up to the powerful media. Because for many, many tens of years, there have been... Uh, a powerful media, and people had little recourse to respond to that. These days, I would argue that that's not the case. If you look at Blake Shelton's Twitter followers, Blake Shelton has 17.9 million Twitter followers, most of whom he has been informing repeatedly that this is not true, that this story was not true, that it is absolutely made up. In Touch Weekly has 194,000 Twitter followers. In print, in Touch Weekly has a circulation of less than 400,000. So Blake Shelton's message denying what this outlet is saying is reaching an audience probably 15 to 20 times as big. Question, where's the damage? He's correcting the record. He has an, a, a medium to put his message out there and shoot down a false statement. And I think that's a little it's a little counterintuitive to what most people would think because you see a headline like this and you think, that's damaging if it's not true. The question I have is, where are the damages? So I think that for all that is made, uh, just to sum up, for all that is made about the ubiquity of social media and the power of the digital media environment, I think it's worth looking at the laws that apply to media and asking some questions about whether they need to be updated to better reflect some of the power changes that have gone on. Individuals have much more power now than they did post or pre-social media. Anyone's message can, on their Facebook feed or Twitter or Medium or anywhere else, become as powerful as anything said in the New York Times, in BuzzFeed, in The Hollywood Reporter, in the Poughkeepsie Time, any media. And should the laws reflect that? I don't know the answer, but I think it's a question that we should start asking. Thank you.